take a moment in this very opened up space in which I believe we all are to think of something that you desire prior to leaving this earthly experience. It could be a change in relationship, financial situation, it could be an item, a thing, or a person, a place, or a situation. But just get an idea in your mind of something that is calling to you. Could even be being a practitioner. And then just let go of it and know that it's present, it's there with you, and it has planted its seed into the rich soil of life. And now I would like you to consider these questions with that open mind of yours. Do you procrastinate? Do you put things off until later that you could do today? Or do you forget to allow yourself to take the time to sit in the silence, to listen for divine wisdom? that inner voice. Or maybe you give yourself plenty of time to sit in the silence, but you forget to take the action that you are guided to take once you receive the word, that inner voice of God. Our title today is called Follow Through. And basically, if you want the one word takeaway, it's that science of mind saying of treat and move your feet. Treat meaning always go to God first. Always go within. Always set that divine idea for yourself into the rich soil. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how to do that. But for now, let's look at that second part of move your feet. Because simply sitting there and sitting in the silence accomplishes nothing except knowing that which you desire. But even if it shows up all on its own without you needing to actually do or say anything, if you're just sitting there, you didn't even notice it showed up. You're still stuck in the, the state of treatment, which is a good thing to live in as long as we're living in it, which I think was on the end of Frank's talk today. Go out and live that which you are putting into place in your mind, in your prayer, in your treatment. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, um, said that he never had in any indication in all of his life that he would be one of the great spiritual leaders of his time. He said that he never actually felt a special calling. And I know the first time I read this, I was like, oh, really grateful, because neither did I. And you know, when you go through ministerial school, you sit with like 50 other people in a great big circle and everyone goes around and says what their calling was, how they came into their calling, and, and they have these fabulous stories about sitting there and getting a burst of light or, or talking with someone and they said something and it was just like, oh, I'm supposed to be a minister. No, nope, not for us. It was an evolution. So I was ever so grateful to er learn that Ernest Holmes was also. He said he never felt a, si a special calling, and he never felt like he was singled out to do some great task, such as creating this magnificent, incredible teaching. He said that for him, he believed his own understanding was a result of, now listen carefully, a result of natural growth and unfolding. That this evolution was available to all. Natural growth and unfolding. That's what we do when we treat, receive guidance, 
and move our feet. And we've probably all experienced that, but I know for myself there are times when something's on my plate and I'm like, I just don't understand why this isn't shifting. And God in me has a great sense of humor because I hear this hilarious laughter going, really? Don't you? Oh, oh, I haven't actually sat down and treated about this. Or, no, I did treat about it and... I got this wisdom and this guidance, but I really didn't think that was for me. Ever done that? <laughs> we all have our own way in which we do it, and one may be procrastinating, following through. However, we each must plant the seed of desire into the law so that it can take action. There's a great story about Victor Hugo who was given a year to write his book and he was commissioned by the publisher and he had agreed he would do it in a year. But he had a year, so he thought, well, you know, I'm really busy with projects I'm doing now and I'm really enjoying life and I love to socialize and I love to entertain and have guests come to the house and travel. So he kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And when his publisher would check in, he noticed that he really didn't have anything yet for him. And so the publisher said, I am going to give you a deadline now, and you have less than six months in which to get that book written for me. Now when the publisher told him this, he felt a little more urgency to accomplish his task. And so he concocted a very strange plan to overcome his procrastination. He gathered all of his clothes and he gave them to his assistant and he said, I need you to lock all my clothes away somewhere where I can't find them, can't get them. He took a great big shawl and that was all he had until that book was written. And the book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, was published two weeks early. So, where did that inspiration come from? He knew himself. We know ourselves. We know what we need to accomplish something. And we have the power to give it to ourselves. And the truth is that whatever we think about, we will bring about. Treat and move your feet. The Buddha said, however many holy words you read, however many you speak, what good will they do if you do not act, if you do not act upon them? Well, we just started a practitioner class, Mark and I. I think Mark did it just for the sole purpose of taking some pressure off of Alan so he didn't have to. <laughs> I don't believe that's true. I think Mark actually had a calling. I, we, we haven't really gone too terribly deeply into that yet, but but it's fascinating. As I'm preparing for practitioner class this week, everything I was reading was exactly about what we're talking about today. I said, isn't that amazing how that happens? Those moments of insight of where things just kind of fall into place, well, maybe it's not, maybe those aren't just vivid aha periods of time, maybe they're just places where I'm open to receiving that at the time knowing that everything in life actually falls into place where it's supposed to be if I open myself to that possibility. And so it's not so much, much about the universe reaching down and touching me as me opening myself up to the realm of possibilities. And when am I going to choose to be the instigator of that rather than the receptor of that? I think that's when it comes to the point of actually following through with ideas that I have. I quite often sit around and ponder on how I'm going to do this and how I'm going to do that. And I love thinking about how I'm going to fix little problems or situations or so on. And how many of those things do I actually follow through and actually do? A lot. <laughs> In her opinion, a lot. In mine, I have maybe a lot more thoughts than actually things I carry through with or follow through with. Joel Goldsmith says, an intellectual knowledge of the fact that God is all is of no value. The only value any truth has in the degree of its is in the degree of its realization. 
All the years that a person has spent in reading truth, hearing truth, thinking truth, attending church services, lectures, or classes are fruitful in leading him to that point where inspiration flows from within his being. Unless we feel the actual presence of God, then as far as we are concerned, we do not have this spirit. It is like saying that electricity is everywhere. And electricity is everywhere, just as the Spirit of God is everywhere. Electricity, however, will be of no value to us unless it is connected in some way to our particular use. So it is with the Spirit of God. It is everywhere in an absolute spiritual sense, but it is only effective in our experience to the extent to which we realize it. We have to take the move. We allow ourselves to receive divine influence. Whether or not we make the steps and make it real in our lives is, is really important. I think it's really maybe more important. It's where we practice actually living the science of mind rather than studying it and saying, wow, that's a beautiful statement. Or wow, that makes me feel good when I hear that. How does it make you when you leave, how much does it make you feel when you actually do that? Have you carried it through to actually making it work in your life? Are you actually living the science of mind? You know, we work the system until we get things going in the right directions, and then we let go. We do what is ours to do in this physical human experience, but there comes a point where there I can no longer do anymore. I've thought all the thoughts that I can do until I absolutely believe it's a possibility and I believe it's a reality, and then I come to the point where I let go and I let spirit take over, let the universal law take over and make it become manifest. But that doesn't mean that I just release absolute responsibility. I still hold consciousness and I still prepare my physical experience for the influx of that good which I have treated for. So sometimes I have a little problem with that idea of letting go and letting God. We feel like, okay, I said the prayer, okay, now it's all done and it should manifest for me, for me automatically. Well, it will as long as you continue to hold the consciousness because what you have done is shifted your own consciousness to your ability to receive. Now, receive. So letting go and letting God is letting God go through the process so we don't have to control the entire thing. But we do have to remain consciously aware of the uh, possibilities flowing to us. Carrying through is something that I remember learning about all my life. And I've never been really athletic, but I did play baseball when I was a kid. And I did learn how to play golf and some other things like that. But I remember playing baseball, you were told that once you swing, you don't stop when you hit the ball. You carry on through. You finish the arc all the way through. And then, as soon as you hit that contact, hit that contact with the ball, you carry through and then run like heck. That's carrying through. You don't hit the ball and say, oh, golly gee, look at it go. <laughs> now, in golf, I learned something quite different. In golf, you hit the ball and you watch it fly. You don't just hit the ball and say, okay, let's move on to the next hole hit the ball and you watch it go. I learned a lot in golf. I had, there's an old old guy that helped me um, learn how to play golf, I think, because he needed somebody to play with. But um, I was, I sometimes I thought I was pretty good at it, but I wasn't exactly sure. But he told me all the details. And there were so many details to playing golf. And it's, you have to, first you figure out where the hole is. And you aim your body this way so you're going in that right direction. And you address yourself to the ball so you know where, the, where you're going to hit. And there are all these things about your stance has to be right, and your grip has to be right, and you have to know how fast you move away from the ball is important, how fast you come back towards the ball is important, hitting, hitting the ground just a little bit before the ball so that you can get a good lift on it, and then keeping this leg straight, keep this arm straight, keep this arm be flexible. You can, only be, you can be flexible, but you can't bend your knees. And all these things, all these details, and I found out Every time I hit the ball, it would go in the woods over here. Sometimes really far in the woods, and sometimes on the edge of the woods. It was always in the woods. And he was always telling me, well, what you did wrong was this, and what you did wrong was that. And so I said, the next time I did it, I would address that issue. Okay. Sometimes I had to go start the back swing like five times before I got the right speed. And 
it's all relevant to how far you are from the hole and all that kind of stuff it really matters but i realized geez this isn't really any fun it's too much work and i suddenly realized what i'm doing is i'm thinking about my back swing and hitting behind the ball and carrying through and then watching the ball fly and don't bend your knees don't bend your arms don't do all that stuff the only thing i'm not thinking about is hitting the ball that's the only thing that never occurred to me while I'm going through the process, never thinking about hitting the ball. And as I'm doing that, I look at my friend, who happened to be a singer, by the way, and I said, oh my gosh, this is just like singing. It's exactly the same thing. And he goes, what? I said, when I teach my, te when I teach my students how to sing, I teach them about their posture, and I teach them about breathing, and I teach them about resonances and I think them well they're going to hear things and where they're going to feel things and projecting and following through and all that kind of singing phrases not notes and all this stuff the only thing I never think about when I'm singing is what's going on in my throat never think about it never occurs to me unless I feel tension then I realize one of those other 16 things are out of sync but if I'm thinking about where I'm going what I'm doing where I want it to go and how I want it to sound all of a sudden it all falls into place so easy. Now, that's that's something I have a passion for and something I don't mind doing work for. I don't mind, mind paying attention to all the details because it's something that I feel passionate about. Golfing, I don't golf anymore. <laughs> it seemed to be too much work. But I did notice <coughs> that the more I paid attention to all the details, the more I followed through and followed the ball and watched it go, it would actually land on the green if I paid attention to all the details. But I thought, okay, I got this now. And I hit it. It's in the woods. <laughs> Following through. I noticed that, and I found that in uh, police training, when they're talking about driving, they, always, they say, look as far as you possibly can in the, in the future, as far as you can possibly see on the horizon, and follow the road as far as you can possibly see. Of course, you keep your peripheral vision on everything that's happening around you, but you pay attention to what's happening as far as you can possibly see in front of you so you can plan ahead when you get to that point always looking to the forward always looking to the future we do the same thing in treatment we look for that goal which we wish to experience we don't look at where we are right now we don't look at our our condition of where we're standing now and the way things are working or are not working in our lives and things that we wish to change we look at the possibilities of that which we wish to experience and constantly keep our focus on that which we wish to experience far ahead of us until it becomes not quite so far ahead of us until it comes not quite so far ahead of us until it becomes present in the now moment we can actually experience it there's a time when we no longer physically or mentally control the conditions around us and when we let the spiritual process take over then we mentally direct and practice affirmative awareness, constantly holding on to that idea which we wish to experience. And when we do that, our thinking is so positive and our thinking is so affirmative, there's no way that the old condition can recur in front of us. We hold ourselves on to the positive process and the activity which we wish to experience. That's the difference between hope and demonstration difference between wishful thinking and manifestation and seeing the picture and realizing or embodying the final condition. We hold that idea from the very first part of the process. You hold an idea of that which you wish to experience and you never release that. You hold that idea of what I wish to experience as the ultimate goal and through the entire process of the treating and waiting for manifestation we hold that constant idea of constantly looking forward into that experience. We're always carrying through from the very first initial act. And I know I personally am glad you chose singing instead of golfing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to conclude today with us um, revisiting in our own mind that idea that you thought of at the beginning, something that you would like to make manifest, something you desire in your life, whatever it may be, as we listen to Ernest Holmes' words for how to, he doesn't say how to, I say that. He says, when you want to do a big thing, and remember everything's a big thing, get the mental pattern, make it perfect, know what it means, 
enlarge your thought. Keep it to yourself. And I believe what he means by that is don't tell people that you know are going to be negative because we do believe in, in race consciousness and collective thinking. So if you know, like putting your prayers and treatments into the treatment bots out there, and you know that all the, the practitioners are going to be treating for you knowing your highest good, well, that's a good thing to tell <coughs> somebody else. So I don't think he means don't tell ab absolutely anyone, but he does mean don't tell anyone that you're going to hear negative feedback from or that won't hold the highest good for you. Pass it over to the creative power behind all things. Wait and listen. Notice he doesn't say how long. He says wait and listen. And when the impression comes, follow it with assurance. That's the move your feet. Don't talk to anyone about it. Never listen to negative talk or pay attention to it. And you will succeed where all others fail. And so it is. <laughs>